So much of what we want to see here and so much of what we feel like God can do here through us through as a church here at South Point comes and it starts with prayer. And so this week we're talking about it. Next week we're going to talk about it. This week, I hope that your takeaway today is that you know two things and two things really, really well. I hope that today you're going to know why we pray. And I hope today, in fact, I know, not hope, that you're going to know how we pray. Now, I want to ask you guys a, a question about prayer. Do you guys remember your first, like, desperate prayer? Like your first prayer of pure desperation? Uh, behind those desperate prayers, there's probably some interesting stories. Uh, again, I want to say some of them, but I just could see my wife sitting in the front here. Even though she's not there shaking her head saying, don't, don't do that. So I'm going to tell you one of mine. Uh, this was a, a real desperate moment for, for us. Casey and I, we were vacationing in Swaziland. Our son Leifa was still in South Africa, and we were there for about 10 days. And on our way back into South Africa... We get to the border post, and the, the guard at the border post, he takes quite a long time with Casey's passport, which is strange. We've been through there a bunch of times, and we got in there okay. We traveled to America on her passport, on her visas, and all that stuff. And when he comes back after a long time, and he says, okay, I've got two options for you, uh, because your wife's visa is fraudulent. And I'm like, there, there's no way that this thing is is fraudulent. Little did I know this would begin a seven-year battle between us and Home Affairs because we were given this, this, this visa that was legitimate, I promise. It turned into a fraudulent visa. And so they told us, they said, we can either keep this and send it to Pretoria, and at some point in the future, maybe, Pretoria will call you and get you from Swaziland to South Africa. And I was like, <clears throat> that is, yeah, the, yeah. That, that is not going to work. And so the other option was that he would just give it to us and he would just turn around and we would go backwards through the border and find a different way into South Africa. So uh, me knowing the country quite well, we left, we went. And on our way to a border post called Balimbu, uh, on our way there, it's about a two-hour drive, we were just praying those desperate prayers. It was one of those like, God, if you will just do this, you have to do this. God, if you'll come through, if you'll do this, if you love me, you'll come through. Or, or, you know, as some of us have prayed, Lord, if you do this, I'll come to church every Sunday. All right? If you do this, Father, I'll, I'll, I'll quit drinking. I'll quit. I'll, I'll just straight and clean. Straight and narrow, Lord. If you show up and you do this, then I'll just promise. I'll give you my life forever. And we were praying those desperate prayers. And when we got to the border, uh, I get in trouble. I don't finish my stories all the time. I just sort of move on and don't give you the conclusion. And people, you know, want to know. Like, hey, I didn't listen to anything in your sermon because I wanted to know how this ended. And so just to let you know, we get to this border post. It was amazing the way God worked. I mean, we'd been that burning stomach, sick to the stomach kind of prayer. And at that border post there... There were some guys on the dirt on dirt bikes, and they were doing a hill climb. So we could hear, you know, as they're going up the hill. And while we're there, I just know that that this guy at the border, when he scans Casey's passport, that it's just going to fraudulent, 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 and that we're going to get turned away or it'll get confiscated. But fortunately, I mean, it was amazing the way God came through. The guys at the border, they were watching the motorbikes. And they were focused on those motorbikes. They didn't even look at Casey's passport. They just scanned it, stamped it, and we got into the country. And that was was one of those just desperate, desperate, desperate prayer moments. God, you've got to come through. Now, I, I believe and I think that these prayers are the easy ones to pray. They're easy. You don't even have to know Jesus to pray this prayer. You could be drunk out of your mind, laying on a wet street somewhere, and, you know, God, I'll never do this again, you know, please. You know, th- th- this is something that we don't have to be a Christian. We don't have to know prayer. It's, this is an easy prayer for everybody. It's the prayers that aren't as desperate that are a lot harder to do. In fact, for me, give you a bit of my journey here is that when I was learning more about prayer, I was in high school, and even actually a little bit afterwards, I I had this real struggle with prayer. For me, it was the very nature of God that was confusing me about prayer. Because I I had this thought of, if God knows everything, then why would I ask Him for something? Because He already knows it. So why why ask Him? You know, 
Am I, am I like my five-year-old Benjamin uh, when he asked me, like, you know, Dad, can I have? Dad, why? You guys ever had kids that are in the why phase, in the why stage? I started telling, I started telling him, uh, well, because you'll die, you know? And that was a good... <clears throat> yeah, until one day Casey said, guess what Benjamin said? I was like, I'm going to change that. I'm not going to say that anymore. So now I've got to come up with another creative way to end the conversation. I kind of felt that way with, with God. Like, okay, God, if I'm asking you for this, but you've already told me the answer or you know the answer, like, am I just, you know, annoying? The other thing was, if God is sovereign, and so kind of what that means is that God can work everything for the good. It doesn't mean that God does bad things to you. That's sin. That's a broken world. That's why bad things happen to us. But God being a sovereign God, He can make those bad things. He can work those things out for your good. He can make something good from it. He can turn beauty from ashes. And so if God is sovereign, then why would I ask Him to change my situation? Because if God wanted me to be healed, if God wanted me to have this miracle, if God wanted to bail me out, then He would do it. Because He's sovereign. And so obviously, because I'm still dealing with this or he hasn't answered this prayer or because this is in my life, this hardship or this thing's in my life, obviously he wants me to go through it. I mean, that makes sense. And so I've, I found myself in this place of like, I don't even know what to pray or how to pray. Am I offensive to God if I pray and I ask him for something? Am I like annoying him? I mean, I just, I didn't know. And it took me a long time to kind of get comfortable in prayer. And so today, I've got this incredibly practical message for you today. And today, no matter where you stand with prayer, whether you know it, you don't know it, you're going to walk away and you're going to know why we pray. You're also going to walk away and, and know how to pray. And that's why God put it on my heart to print out my notes for you and just put it in your hands so that when you go home, it doesn't just end here. You can say, I, I know a model. I know a method of how to pray. So I'm going to go through these. I've got a, a ton of points. And again, this is extremely practical. So we're going to move through it kind of quick. But here's the first reason as to why we pray. First of three. We pray to acknowledge God and then to allow Him in our lives. God is a God that loves to be chosen. That is acknowledgement. We're choosing to acknowledge God. I'll give you an example in my life. Because I'm a dad, I've got these three kids. One of my favorite times of the day is at night when Wyatt, our little two-year-old gremlin, as he's now being named, you know, this week he picked up his water bottle and threw it at the TV and broke the TV. Why? Why? How's that even in a human to do that? How is that even... How is that even there, you know? I get a picture from Casey, half a TV works, which is made, yeah. So the Olympics are super fun, you know, so we can only see like half of what's going on. But this kid just, Chuck just broke it there. But, so that's why he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a gremlin. So when he gets out of the bath at night, he's all like hyped up, you know, like when you, bathe the, uh, when you give your dog a bath, like a border collie a bath. He gets out, he runs around the yard, rolls in the dirt and all that stuff. Why is the exact same way, but my favorite sound, probably top two, maybe top three in my whole life, is when he gets out of that bath and I hear him running through our house going, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And what he loves to do is he runs out and he screams my name, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And he runs into my arms so that I can pick him up and throw him up in the air and spin him around in circles. And then I set him back down. And then the next thing he does... As he gets over against the wall, and he puts one foot out. I guess they taught him this in school. Puts one foot out, and he looks at me, and he goes, on your mark. So the rest of that is on your mark, get set, go, like he's going he's gonna to race. But he runs, and the problem with a two-year-old running is he doesn't look forward. He looks backwards. So he's, he's looking at me while he's running. You know, he's, so I try and stay ahead of him. But that, that acknowledgement from my son, daddy, 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 I mean, that's that's that's. That's the heart of Christ. That's the heart of God. God's saying, can you just acknowledge me, please? And then he wants us to allow him into our lives. It's not just acknowledging daddy, daddy, daddy. It's allowing. It's saying, okay, come here. Let me give you a hug. Let me just 
uh, let me allow you in your presence. Again, I'll use my two-year-old as an example. Sometimes I get offended because he doesn't want to hug. You know, he, he, when he wants to throw a fit, terrible twos. All right, we have a child that breaks TVs, and he is a, a, a terror at times. And sometimes I'll be riding on that daddy, daddy, daddy high, but he's beyond that. He's past that. And so I'll say, get, come, give me a hug. You know, get, let daddy give you a hug. And he'll, he shakes his head and he goes, no, you know, no. And that, that, I'm like, am I offended by my two-year-old? I have to check my own heart there. But we acknowledge God, and then we allow him into our lives. So that allowance of God into our lives happens through prayer. So here's a great quote for you. Prayer, prayer is the language of weakness. Weakness is a good thing. Prayer is the language of weakness, which is the acknowledgement of needing God. So a great uh, another quote that I really love is, a day without prayer is a boast against God. See, we don't pray about our finances because we don't know or we don't need God in our finances. We don't pray about our marriage because we don't need God in our marriage. We don't pray uh, about the state of our heart or the state of, of our, our jobs or work, whatever it is. We don't pray about it because we don't need God in it. To acknowledge and to allow God in it is to say, God, I, I actually, I do need you here. Now, I think that uh, even for me, I, I made a list this week of all the areas that I don't pray about. And on the areas that I don't pray about was like, you know, finances and marriage. I mean, those are all on my list as well. And I thought like, oh, man, I do need you in this, God. I do want you to be a part of this. I, okay, this is what's called a healthy conviction. And I hope you receive it this way. I am not condemning you if you don't pray about something in your life doesn't push you away or separate you that's condemnation that's not of God and this conviction drew me tenderly to God and I sat down and I made my list again and I said Lord I pray I pray for my finances I acknowledge you and I allow you to come into our finances I just went down the list it took me like five minutes but it was great that's why we pray Jesus is not a God, God is not a God that invades our life. He shows up, but He doesn't invade. He wants to be acknowledged and then invited in. Revelation 3.20, so many of us know this verse, but behold, I stand at the door and knock. It doesn't say kick. It doesn't say break down. It doesn't say light on fire. It doesn't say, you know, taking a megaphone. It doesn't say calling you or what's happened to you a hundred times. It just, He knocks. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. See, Christ is saying, I'm going to knock, and if you let me in, I will, I, I will walk into an intimate relationship with you. I'll, I'll share a meal with you. I'll dine with you, and you with me. It's, it's like, that's a promise, a promise of intimacy with our Creator. So that's, that's the first reason why we pray. And there's a lot of other reasons, but I'm just going to give you three today. The second one is we build a prioritized personal relationship with God. God wants a personal relationship with you. So you can't know somebody that you don't talk to. Part of our issue with prayer and our, and our issue with God is that we don't know God. We don't know the nature of God. So we're forming an opinion and a judgment on a God that we don't, we don't really know. So when we get upset with God or we get offended by God, or we get upset or offended that He's not come through, He's not answered a prayer in our life, or if we just don't understand Him, and therefore because we don't understand Him, we don't like Him, or if we see other Christ followers and we don't understand them, and because we don't understand them, we decide, well, I don't like, I don't like God, I don't want this God thing. You probably don't know God. And a good way to actually know God is to talk to Him. God just wants you to chat. God wants me time with you. He, just want, he wants me time with Chris. Where He just says, hey, every morning, Chris, just show up. Just show up. Turn the phone off. Turn this off. Just get in front of me. Just show up. And sometimes that's me journaling. Sometimes that's me, you know, reading the Word. Sometimes that's me just putting my head, my forehead on the Bible because I'm tired, hoping that the wisdom absorbs through the pages and into my brain. 
But, but really what I'm doing in that moment is I'm just saying, God, I showed up today. Right? And, and I, 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 I'm here. And I'm tired, so I'm not going to talk. But I'll listen, and I'll let you talk. So we pray because we want that relationship with God. A prioritized personal relationship. The third reason is to exercise our spiritual authority. Did you know that when you, were, uh, when you gave your life to Christ, that Jesus gave you spiritual authority? Luke chapter 10, verse 19 tells us this. Listen carefully. This is Jesus' teaching. Listen carefully. I've given you authority, and that, now, uh, that you now possess. So I've given you authority that you now possess. And with that, it's so that you can tread on serpents and scorpions. And you have the ability to exercise that authority. I've given it to you. You possess it. And now you have the ability to use it and the ability to do it. Over all the power of the enemy over Satan. You've got authority over Satan. Don't go out and step on serpents and scorpions. Let me just you know, preface that. Uh, I don't want you guys running through Kirstenbosch. Finding the Cape Cobra and saying, Pastor Chris said that I've got authority to, you know, to step on you. Uh, don't do that. Uh, you can do that with spiders, but not, don't do that with these here. But God is saying that you've got the authority to step on the enemy, to put your foot down. And to say, no, 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 no. Not today, Satan. Not in my life, because nothing will in any way harm me. What did I do to deserve that? Nothing. That's the gift of Jesus. But as a Christ follower, you've been given this. And sometimes we take our prayers to God and we say, Lord, uh, I feel like I'm under attack. Can you please help me? Can you free me from this attack? I feel like, Father, that I'm just being surrounded by all sides. And we wonder, well, God, where are you? God, you've not come to my rescue. God, I don't feel the goosebumps, you know. I don't, I don't feel like you're, like you're there. And God's looking down at you and he's saying, I, I've already, I'm not going to do for you what I've already given you the authority to do for yourself. Chris, here you go. You're not waiting on me. I'm already there. I'm already a step ahead. It's just time for you to do it. In Matthew 18, 18, here's another example of the authority that we have. And when we pray, we get to exercise this authority. If we don't pray, if we don't talk to God, we don't use it. It just stays packed away. And in verse 18, Matthew, it says this, I assure you, and I most solemnly say to you, whatever you bind, we're going to talk about bind and bound and loose here in just a second. Whatever you bind, which means to forbid or declare to be improper and unlawful, whatever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, which means to permit, declare lawful on earth, shall have already been loosed in heaven. What this verse is telling us is that to bind is to disallow. And so he's saying, you have the authority to bind whatever is not lawful. So when you experience an attack in your life, when you feel like your kids are under attack, when you feel like you're under attack, in heaven that has already been disallowed. That's why God kicks Satan out of heaven. That's why there is nothing but the perfection of God in heaven. It's already been bound there. God's just saying, okay, now you just... Now do it down there. It's already been done before you. Whatever has been loosed in heaven, which means allowed, has already been done here. Jesus is telling the disciples, you have the authority to do this. You've got it. All you have to do is pray and use it. And so these are, are, are three kind of uh, just, I, I hope that these are ways that you can grasp onto it. When you find yourself saying, why, why pray? Well, try these three things. Acknowledge God. Allow Him into your life. Run down the hallway. Daddy, 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 daddy. Have a, a prior, Prioritize that personal relationship with God. He wants me time with you. And then, do you want to walk in the spiritual authority? I promise everybody's life could probably use some of this here. Or, hey, gain some confidence. God's given you this. He's equipped you for this. Don't walk around saying, I'm under attack, I'm under attack. There's something wrong in my life. The devil's after me. You know, the devil may be after you because you're just not turning around and saying, not in my life, Satan. It's not happening here. My, my children are not a victim of you because I walk in the authority of God. 
And when I go to my children's bedrooms and I pray over their bed and over their rooms and I say the authority of God is in this place and Satan, you have no place here. You're never going to have a place here. This is not a place for you to be. I'm going to bind you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to get rid of you out of this house, off this property, out of my children's lives. You're operating in an authority that God has already set before you. Those are three great reasons to pray. Shake your head if you agree. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, here's two ways not to pray. All right. These are, uh, I'm going to give you two ways not to pray that Jesus says. And then I'm going to give you seven kind of dynamic elements that make up like a, a, a good prayer life. And those seven, that's that little sheet that you have there. But the first way not to pray is Jesus actually says to his disciples, don't pray in a public or religious manner. So we're going to be looking at Matthew 6, 5 through 13, which is where the disciples are asking Jesus, Jesus, how do we pray? They see him going to pray. They see him going into the garden. They see him wake up early. And they see that he's spending time with his father. And they're saying, okay, we, maybe we want that. How do we do that? And so Jesus teaches them. He says, okay, well, here you go. Here's how to do that. But before he tells them how, he tells them how not to which I think is pretty interesting. He says in in verse 5 here, he says, When you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they they, they already have their reward. See, this this is a state of the heart. This isn't about corporate prayer here in church. There's nothing wrong with praying out loud. But Jesus is identifying that there, there is a condition of the heart. When you are putting yourself out on display, when it's your words and your look and your appearance, you want people to see how holy you are and how wonderful you are. And if, if, if that's what you're doing, then Jesus is saying your pride is your own reward, which means that you're going to fall by your pride. You already have the reward, the fruit of what you're doing. And the fruit is not from me. The fruit is not from me, God. The fruit is from yourself, from your own pride. And instead, Jesus gives, now he gives kind of the the correction to this. And he says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you've shut the door, so you're taking away the way that, now the world can't see you. Your friends can't see you. Your influence isn't, isn't available. This is you saying, I just want to prioritize this personal relationship with you, God. So I'm shutting the door. And you go into your quiet place and you pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Secret prayers or prayers in secret bring open rewards, open blessings. See, if you want blessings and you want rewards in your life, and I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel here. I'm talking about evidence of being in a relationship with your creator. If you want that in your life, spend some time with Him intimately. If you put all your, your faith or, or if your identity is to stand in the synagogues, which is where everybody in town came to, or, or the temple, and just to pray and pray and pray so that you get noticed or you get looked at, I mean, that, there's no reward in that. So that, this isn't saying that you should not pray in public. But this is saying that if you want the reward of a relationship with God, then you go to your secret place with Him. And the second reason, or the second way, sorry, that Jesus says don't pray this way is He says don't babble and use non-relational words. So let me tell you what this is not. Uh, do you guys know, uh, I don't know if you're in a community group or a small group, you guys have those people in your group that pray for like nine minutes. They pray for a really long time, you know. Those, those, this is, that's not what we're talking about here. And it's, it's always those people that they want to stand, but they're going to pray for nine minutes, and they want to hold hands. I'm like, I'm not holding your hand for nine minutes. I know that you're a long prayer. I'm sitting down, and I'm just settling in for the long ride here. I'm going to just sit and get comfortable. That's not what this is. That's not a babbling person or a non-relational person. I know a lot of people that pray for a long time. They've got a lot to say to God, and they worship God through prayer, and that's not what this is. So if, if you feel like, oh, man, am I doing something wrong because I could just talk to God for a long time, that, that's not what this is about. Instead, what this is about, Jesus explains it in the next verse, in verse 7. 
And he says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. And again, I want to clarify this. I've told you before that if you, if you only have the energy to say the name of Jesus, that's not what this is talking about. If you don't have the words, you can say the name of Jesus over and over and over again. Like Jesus, you know, just Jesus, just speaking his authority into your life. But that's between you and God. That's in your secret place. That's not out in public. Jesus says, don't use these vain repetitions. And he reveals what this means. Because for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Does God hear you because of how many words you use? Or does God hear you because he knows your heart? Because you have an authentic relationship with him. He knows you because he has a prioritized personal relationship with you. You've acknowledged him. You've allowed him into your life. You've invited him in. You've told him through your weakness that, God, I need you. And the opposite of that is a person that thinks, if I use fancy words over and over and over and over again, then God will hear me. Therefore, do not be like them, for, you, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. So God is saying that I, I know your heart. There's no hiding the state of your heart. And so those are, the, those are the two things that Jesus says. Those came from Jesus' mouth, directly from him. That's not my interpretation. That's directly from Christ. Don't let this be the way you pray. Don't shape your prayer life off of this. Now, we're going to talk about the Lord's Prayer. We all know the Lord's Prayer. Our fa- well, I, I say that, but many of us do. Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? We're going we're gonna to read that here in just a second. But did you know that in those seven verses, or actually six verses, and one of them is is split, or five or six, there is actually a system for how to pray. You know, when the disciples said, how do we do this? Jesus taught them how, and he starts that out by saying in verse 9, he says, in this manner, therefore pray. See, what Jesus is saying, he's not saying memorize these words and pray them over and over and over again. He's saying, in this manner. So that leads us to think, okay, is there, is there a system here? Is, is there a, a, a pattern here? Is there a guiding kind of nature to this? Now, I think that Christ is laying out a framework for us. And so this is how we're going to talk about these seven. We're going to go through them quickly because they're not very complicated. And these seven things that we go through, you're going to walk away today. And you're going to be able to apply all seven of these to your life. I've been doing it for the last two weeks. It works. It works, it works for me. If it works for me, it'll probably work for you. But it really, it works. So let's look at the Lord's Prayer in, in its whole, just so you get a context here. So Jesus says, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isn't it neat that buried in this, buried in what we've memorized, what we've grown up quoting, that buried in this is a loving, uh, amazing template for us to apply to our lives. And the great thing is, is you can apply it in two minutes or you can apply it in two hours. It depends on how much time you have that day. And so here's, here's your seven uh, dynamic elements to prayer that we pull from this scripture here. Number one, it's with thanksgiving, praise, and worship. So what this means is you start your prayer with thanksgiving, you start it with praise, and you start it with worship. See, you look at how not to pray, which means you're checking your heart. Okay, God, am I coming to you with, with authenticity in my heart? Do I have pride in my life? You're kind of dropping all that stuff off at the beginning. And then you're coming first and foremost with thanksgiving, with praise, and with worship. And look at how this translates in the verse. In verse 9, In this manner therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. See, this word hallowed is a, is a term for praise, for thanksgiving, but really what it is, it's the recognition of the divinity of God. It's ascribing to God His, His true nature as God, as the God. The glory and magnitude of him on the throne in heaven, 
We're saying, God, hallowed be your name, meaning, God, your name is worthy. Your, God, er, your name is great. You are my only God. You are God the Father, God the Redeemer. You're God uh, the Lover. You're God the Rescuer. God, I speak who you are in my life. In fact, if you struggle with, okay, how, how do I apply that every day? Here's, here's some easy phrases for you. It says, uh, or I've got this written for you. Father, I will not use your name in a bad way. Because we're saying, hallowed be your name. Glory be your name. Honor to your name. I recognize the divinity of your name. Hallowed be your name. If I use it in a bad way, please correct that in me. And then to put it even simpler to you, if there are bugs on the windshield of my heart, wash them off so that I can see who you really are. See, sometimes we lose perspective on who God really is. And sometimes in order to gain perspective on who God really is, we just need to say, God, hallowed be your name. Let me remind myself that you are God, that you are divine, that you are my, you, you love me, you save me, you sent your son for me. See, when you spend some time worshiping God and thanksgiving, praise and worship, you set up your heart for everything else to follow. And after you've done that, the next step for you is to surrender. It's surrendering to God's authority and then inviting His guidance into every single part of your life. It's saying, okay, God, I've, I've got to let you have authority over my life. And in verse 10, Jesus describes this to His disciples. He says, your kingdom come. First of all, I, I, I don't have time to do this, but I want to anyway. Your kingdom come. Can you imagine God's kingdom in heaven? Just think about that for a second. The perfection that's in heaven. The no pain, no sorrow, no sin. And, and think about God on His throne. Being just worshipped by the angels. And His love just pouring out. Think about that. And so when you say, your kingdom come. You're saying, what is in heaven come down here in my life on earth. Which means that you're asking the authority of God to be in your life because no one has authority in heaven over God it's just God Lucifer tried that and God said gone and he sent him down to earth with a third of the angels went with him because he was prideful it's only God and his authority that's in heaven so when we say Lord let your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven we are saying God I want your authority in my marriage in my finances I want your authority in my daily life I want your authority in, in my, my habits I want your kingdom and your authority to come down into heaven or to come down into earth and to consume my life it's not about my authority I want your authority to be here that's actually a big statement to say. But to say, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is daily you inviting God to have authority in your life. To just say, come on down, God. Take authority over me. Number three, the next one, seeking God's provision. See, provision comes after surrender. So first you surrender to God's authority, and then next you ask God for provision. Now, the verse for us is, give us this day our daily bread. And one of the things that I think that this means is wisdom. Lord, give us this day our daily wisdom. Every day we wake up and we're asking for bread. We're asking for the bread of life. We're asking for the word. Lord, give us your wisdom. You know, Jesus says that we don't survive on bread alone, but by the word of God, the living word of God. And so, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. That bread that, that, the, or that, that the Israelites were given, that manna from heaven, it, it sustained them. It took care of them. It nourished them. And when we take on that bread, we also take on Christ. Christ broke his body in communion. And he said, as I break this bread and I pass it around, you eat of me. You know, you're, you're consecrating God by, by doing it. So when we're asking God to give us this day our daily bread, we're asking God for everything that Jesus comes with, especially his wisdom. You know, you will never, you will never ever regret a decision that you make with Jesus. You'll never regret that. So whether you're, let's take this to a very practical place. Whether you're praying for, do I take out this loan? Do I make this business decision? Do I start working with this partner? What do I study in school? Do I even go to university or college? Lord, what, what job do I take? Lord, what do I do next? 
That's really what we're asking. God, what do I do next? Do we want to build? Do, what is next? Well, make that decision with God. Ask Him for wisdom. And you'll never regret a decision that you make with the wisdom of God. Number four, seeking God's forgiveness. See, I hope that you can see that this is a pattern. That you start with, that you start with prayer and thanksgiving. You go to surrender. You're asking God then for wisdom. And as you go through this, this, this template, as Jesus said, pray in this way, in this manner. You're starting to unpack and cover all these areas in your life. You're worshiping God because you're intentional about it. And so this fourth one, seeking God's forgiveness. In verse 12, Jesus says, And forgive us our debts. God, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my debts as we forgive our debtors. Not only do we need forgiveness from God, but we need to learn to forgive others. Jesus said that the one that forgives much is forgiven much. And we have a lot of room in our lives to forgive others, which really, and this is a hard statement to live by, an easy statement to say. So I want to recognize that. We all have a lot of opportunities to forgive people. And we should all be taking those opportunities. Because as we forgive much, we are forgiven much. Now, again, that's a much easier statement to say than it is to apply. But maybe you can apply that to your life. Okay, the, the, the fifth thing here, just got a few more. Asking for supernatural direction and protection. That's part of that prayer. Is, is we're saying, God, give me your supernatural protection and direction. In verse 13, it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we're saying, God, give me direction. Now, th- this prayer works out in your life easily. And do not lead us into temptation. Father, lead my steps today. Help me know which path to take. Help me to stay away from temptation. Father, let let your voice be in my heart. Let your conviction guide me. And open up my ears so that I hear your voice. See, God wants to protect you. He he wants to keep you out of places that are going to lead you into sin or lead you into guilt or lead you into regret. And he will do this to the point that that you have to decide, I'm going to make a dumb decision today. I, I, I know God's telling me not to. I know God wants to lead me out of temptation, but I'm just going to make a dumb decision. That, that, that's on us, not on God. But we pray, God, lead me not into temptation, but instead deliver us from the evil one. God has the power and the authority to do that in your life. If you feel like you sit in temptation, if you feel like you're out of control, and you feel like maybe something's got more control over you than you have over it, this is your prayer right here. God, divinely and supernaturally lead me. Number six, it's the acknowledgement of divine right. You know, we spend a lot of time here on earth building our own empires. I do not have a problem with you building a successful business and building great finances. Uh, In fact, I, I hope that you all get super rich, and then I hope you all have a huge burden for tithing, and then I can get my Feroza fixed, right? You know. Now, there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with building a large amount of money and wealth. This is about the state of your heart. Because acknowledging the divine right of God is to acknowledge that only God has a kingdom and only God has power and only God has glory. In verse 13, it continues and it says, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Do I have a kingdom here on earth? No. I may try and build one, but I don't have it. Do I have power here on earth? No. I may convince myself that I do, but actually I don't. Do I have glory forever here? No. No. When I'm gone, a bunch of people are going to forget that I was even here. It's only God has kingdom and power and glory, and we're recognizing that divinely, that it's Him and only Him. And then the, the last one, it's probably my favorite one, it's a declaration of faith. And you'll see on that, that handout, or if you don't have it, as you hear me now, verse 33 or verse 13 ends with one word, amen. And amen means, yes, let it be so, and it is a declaration. See, amen is not just signing off, where you throw a, a Hail Mary prayer up into the sky, and then you say, amen, signing off. Now I'm moving on with the rest of my day. 
Amen is instead a declaration of faith. It's saying, because I can put my faith in you, or I'm choosing to put faith in you, I'm declaring, yes, let it be so. If you've been around a long time, maybe you notice that I end every prayer with, in your name, Jesus, amen. Because I'm declaring in faith what I just prayed for is possible. And that if God wants to, he'll make it so and he'll make it happen. It's not up to me to judge whether it's worthy of happening or or being made so. It's up to me to just declare it. Amen. Guys, we have things in our lives that we need to start preach or we need to start saying amen over. We need to declare in faith. You've got some bold prayers that you need to pray and then you need to finish it out with amen. So I want to give us an opportunity here for a ministry moment before we go into worship. And today, like I said, is a very practical message. Very practical. And it's for whether you've been praying for your whole life or whether you you, you have no idea how to pray, this can apply to you. And part of this is the idea that we transfer our trust from ourselves and we put our trust in God. Now, if you're new to Jesus or you're not a Christ follower, when you give your life to Christ, we're asking that that you transfer your trust from you, you transfer it into God. You're saying, God, I give you my life. I trust you for my salvation. If you've been a Christ follower, you currently are, you've been for a long time, even if you've got an amazing relationship with Jesus, what I'm asking you to do is, is every day to say, God, is there something in me that I need to trust you for? And transfer that trust out of me, my kingdom, my power, my glory that I think I'm building. And instead put it in you. So we're going to all bow our heads, close our eyes. I'm just going to lead us in a a quick prayer. And our band's going to lead us in just an amazing, amazing worship set. So Heavenly Father, I pray right now in this ministry moment that you would draw everybody to you that needs to come to you. Father, we open up our front, we open up our, our, the sides of our stage that people can come forward if they need ministry for anything at all. I pray that you remove every distraction, physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional, and call people to you. I pray, Father, I, I speak your authority over the communion table in the back, over the candles and over the communion, that, Father, you just lay your spirit on that place, and when people come there to take communion, to light a candle in remembrance or in significance of a prayer with you, I pray, Father, that your authority is there, that people's hearts and minds and eyes are opened, and that people just get ministered by you. And, Father, in this worship moment, I pray, Lord, that everybody that needs you is called to you without distraction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.